everyone. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to all of our alumni joining us. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Greg Leparati. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Baruch. Um, really excited to be having this event today. Welcome back to all of our Bearcats, Statesmen, whatever you played as when you were a Baruch student athlete. Normally we host this event each year in the ARC arena and we watch a men's and women's basketball doubleheader, sometimes even swimming. Uh, and it had been a tradition that had been going on for about five years now. It was growing every year, but then obviously things are different this year for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but we're still really excited to have this virtually. And we're all hoping in alumni relations and at Baruch that uh, as things progress over the next, uh, next few months, people getting vaccinated and everything, we can hopefully once again reconvene next year and reconvene again on campus soon. Uh, that being said though, we've got a packed agenda this evening uh, as we celebrate our athletics connection virtually. There are a lot of reasons to stick around throughout this entire event prizes, giveaways, a chance to mingle with fellow alumni. Just a few quick ground rules. Uh, you can leave your cameras on. We love to see everybody. It's great to see so many smiling faces and kids too, we love it. Um, but please mute your microphones um, uh, just to make sure no ambient noise gets in the way of anything. Um, I would now like to introduce Erin Pomacala from Athletics to say a few words, Erin. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Paul McCullough. I am the Associate Athletics Director. Heather McCullough, the Director of Athletics, unfortunately is unable to be here, but she did pass along some remarks which she'd like me to read. So I'm gonna read her, her words to you. On behalf of the Director of Athletics and Recreation, Heather McCullough, she wanted to greet all of our alumni, families, and friends of the program who were able to join us on this special evening, given this un unprecedented yet very special occasion. Tonight, we are here to celebrate our past alumni who have played on our courts and our fields, swam in our pool, ran many a trail, and performed with outstanding achievement in the classroom. While unfortunately, I cannot be there with you this evening for the celebration, please know our Bearcat family continues to grow and bond every day, and we are excited to keep that winning tradition going. This year has been very different and difficult for many of you in our Baruch community, and she wanted to acknowledge that you are not alone, you are Bearcat strong, and we will all get through this together. A brief update as we are working with CUNY and CUNYAC and the medical advisory team and also Baruch to configure a plan for the return of fall sports. She encourages everyone to check for updates on social media and enjoy the event. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Erin. Great to hear from, from Heather and the athletics department. Um, and it, it'd be so amazing if we can get um, sports back in the fall. So everybody's fingers are crossed um, and things are looking good. So, you know, optimistic, I'm trying to be optimistic. Yeah, things have looked good so far, so we'll see. Um, thank you, Aaron. So now I'd like to invite two alumni to speak who have done a really tremendous job in helping to grow our athletics network. They've created a Facebook group and LinkedIn group. Uh, the LinkedIn group has uh, 350 plus members, which is fantastic. And I will provide those links in the chat. We'll also provide those links in our follow-up email too. So don't worry if you miss anything, you'll be able to join those groups. I'd like to now introduce Yi Chung Fang and Marlon Samwaru. Hi, everyone. Hi. So good to see you all. And I know this is definitely not what it's like when we were back at Baruch, but it's so good to have a reason to see everyone's faces here. And we just wanted to chime in and say, thank you for being here. Thank you, Baruch Athletics, Baruch Alumni for helping put this together. Always a pleasure working with you guys all. Um, couple updates. Um, some of you guys may remember when we first started this, we had sent out a survey to gain interest on mentorship. And just know that that is still in the works. We're working with Brug alumni to finalize an actual platform we can use to help officiate the program. So stay tuned for that and definitely feel free to reach out if you're interested. We're definitely making sure that's going to happen. And as Greg has mentioned, we finally have a Facebook page just so that we can have a more community social ambiances group. So because we know not everyone's always on LinkedIn. So please, if you're in it, invite your fellow Bearcats. And if you're not, feel free to search for the group and request to join. And lastly, when we started this about half a year ago, we really just wanted to bring 
Bearcat alums and current student athletes together just so that we could build a stronger network. And now that we have grown and now that we have a name and a platform, we would really love to get your help if you're interested in working with us and trying to make the best out of this network and provide what works for everyone, we would love that. So if you're interested in joining us, please feel free to reach out to me or Marlon. And yeah, let's get this whole party started. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Yi and Marlon. Thank you so much for all the work you've done to grow this network. And to, to quickly piggyback off what Yi was saying, um, you know, we are looking to uh, create an online mentoring platform specifically for mentoring from alum to alum, possibly even student to alum. We're still exploring that, but we hope to have that launched very soon this semester. And then the hope is going to be, you know, let's start bringing groups onto that. And athletics is going to be the first one we try it with. So we're really excited to get that going. Um, and just thank you so much to Yi and Marlon for coming to us with the idea of growing this athletics network uh, in, a, in a really professional as well as fun manner. So uh, thank you very much again. So now let's get into some of the, the crux of this event. Uh, now it is March Madness. I just happened to watch my alma mater, St. John's, lose in the Big East tournament, of course. That's typical of St. John's, but uh, it is March Madness. And so as a result, let's start getting into the sports spirit. We have Brandon Snook here, who is uh, someone we've collaborated with plenty of times in the past, uh, who is going to do some social distancing trivia, sports themed and Baruch themed. And there may be prizes at the end. So definitely uh, give it your all. And Brandon, I, I yield the floor to you. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, great to be with all of you. This is uh, my fourth, no, my fifth, no, yeah, yeah, either fourth or fifth time hosting uh, a trivia event for the fine Baruch alums. It's, uh, this is by far, though, the largest one that we've had so far. So I'm really happy uh, to see all of your fine sporty faces. Um, so yeah, we're going to play a little bit of trivia. We're just going to do um, the honor system. So if you if you have a pen or a paper nearby, you can keep track of your own scores. Unless I say otherwise, all of the questions that I do tonight are going to be worth three points apiece, three points each. We're going to be doing some uh, visual, some audio, and some general potpourri, but it's all going to be sports and or Baruch centric. All right, so as I see almost everybody, yeah, everybody's on mute. So that's a good thing. Um, that way you're not yelling the answers out loud and giving the answers away to everybody else until the right time. So let us begin right now with the first round. The first round is going to be a visual round. We're gonna be looking at one of my favorite things. One of the reasons why I'm a trivia host is because I like weird things like logos, logos and jingles and slogans, weird things like that. I probably should have been an ad man, but I'm not. But I'm gonna show you some logos. All of these logos, I'm gonna show you 10 of them actually. Five of them have something to do, well, I'll just tell you, they're NBA logos of the past. NBA logos of the past. So, they're no longer in use. They're retired logos from NBA teams. All of our favorite March Madness players hope to be in the NBA one day, or at least the G League. So I'm going to show you five of those. And then I'm going to show you five other logos that have nothing to do with sports, but they do have something to do with Baruch. There's some Baruch ties to them, okay? Um, but they're, you know, they're like corporate logos, brand logos that uh, most of you all probably know and love. All right. So again, you're, we're going to be keeping uh, your own score. Don't say the answers out loud if you're not on mute. Each one's going to be worth three points apiece. I'm going to go through all of these logos in one fell swoop. We're going to do one quick pass of all 10 logos. And then we're going to go back and look at each one individually again, and we will reveal the answers. Here we go. Here is logo number one. This nice colorful logo at one point might have been an NBA logo, or it might be some logo associated with Baruch. I don't know. That's logo number one. Here's logo number two. Okay. I got to throw in some doozies there. That one, I hope you all get that one right at least. Here comes number three. This is a happy looking person with a ball in his hand. Number four. Nice iconic logo. Moving on now. Number five. Mm -hmm. 
Moving on to number six. We got four more left. Here's number seven. Number eight. Two more, number nine. And number 10, last one. All right, let that marinate for a second. We're gonna go through all of them again. So I'm gonna show you each one individually again, give you another second to think about it. And then if you wanna take yourself off mute, just press space bar and unmute yourself. You can yell the answer out loud if you want to, all right? So here is logo number one. Give it another second for anybody who's still on the fence. And now anybody, anybody, if you want to chime in and give a guess, what is this logo for? Any takers? It is an NBA logo from the past. Five more seconds for anybody. No guesses? Spurs, Spurs. There you go. There you go. Very good, Perry. That is correct. Give yourself three points to all of you who gave me the San Antonio Spurs. That's their nice Fiesta logo that they used in the 90s. I'm a Dallas Mavericks fan, but I can appreciate the Spurs. This is what their logo looks like now. They took away the paintbrush. All right, number two. We all know this one. Say it out loud. Somebody. Chase. Chase. That's right. That's right. Chase or J.P. Morgan Chase. Boy. Chase Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. So there is a connection to Baruch. Anthony Chan, who's a Baruch alum, he graduated in 1979 from Baruch College. He is Chase Banks or J.P. Morgan Chase's chief economist. You might see him if you watch CNBC a lot. He's on there quite a bit. All right, number three. If you know your basketball, you probably have figured this one out already. This logo from the past, an NBA logo. It's a spelunker. He's got a little pickaxe in his hand. What could it be? Who could it be from? All right. Mavericks? Nope, not Mavericks, but I do love the Mavericks. Nope, that pickaxe, a guy, he's looking for gems. Specifically, not Dallas, but Denver. Denver Nuggets. Oh. Nuggets of gold. This is what their logo looks like now. They still have those pickaxes in there. All right, number four. This is also an old logo, but we should all know this one. MTA. There you go, MTA. Good job. Yeah, the subway, the subway, New York City Transit. Some of those older train cars still have the, uh, the old livery, you want to call it? That's what it is now, though. All right, moving on to number five. Number five, this is an NBA logo from the past. Hey, Pistons. Pistons. Yes, very good. Very good, guys. Yes, the Detroit Pistons. More like the Detroit tailpipes down here. Yeah, that was their 90s logo. This is what it is now. Going back to the, this was like their original logo, and they kind of tweaked it for today. All right, no, oh, I forgot to tell you, the MTA, the MTA. Uh, let's see. Fernando Ferrer, he got his master's degree in 2004 from Baruch, and he's a former chairman of the MTA. All right. Moving on to number six. This icon, I shouldn't say iconic logo, but this logo, there is a Baruch connection to it. New work. Yes, there it is. There it is. Who said that? Miguel said that. We work. In 2017, co-founder and CEO of WeWork, Adam Newman, got his bachelor's degree from Baruch. Number former CEO. Former CEO. Oh, he stepped down recently? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been an interesting year for all SoftBank-funded uh, companies. Number seven, number seven. This NBA logo, got a sword, 
not a pirate. It's a Cleveland Cavalier. This was the original logo for the Cavs way back in the day, long before LeBron came and went and came and went again. That's the logo now. Still has that sword, though. Number eight. Go ahead. HSBC. Yeah, very good. I see. I used to see these logos all the time in the uh, the jetways when I'd get on the plane. HSBC, they really cornered the market on jet bridge advertisements. So back in 1969, William F. Aldinger III, he graduated from Baruch College. He's a former chairman and CEO of the North American arm of HSBC. All right, this one might be tough. Number nine, this is an NBA logo. Follow it, follow it. No, great guess. It's not the Bullets. It's not the Bullets. It's a team, but but it, yeah, so the Washington Bullets are now the Washington Wizards, but this team also no longer technically exists in name. It is the Buffalo Braves. The Buffalo Braves, the franchise in the late 70s, moved to the other side of the country and became the San Diego Clippers. And now, of course, it is the L.A. Clippers. All right, rounding out number 10. This one's easy enough. Makes me hungry. Ben and Jerry's. Skip to dessert. Very good. Ben and Jerry's. Cherry Garcia. Thank you very much. I could eat a hand packed pint right now. I'd like to, but I don't have any. Oh, well. Um, let's see. Robert Holland got his master's degree in 1969 from Baruch. He was a short time former president and CEO of Ben and Jerry's, only for about a couple of years. But yeah, lots of nice brute ties to these great brands. And now let's move on to round two. Round two is going to be a general potpourri round. Again, all answers are going to be worth three points each. All of these, I, I say potpourri, they do all have something in common. We're all talking about Baruch Sports here, Baruch Sports. So you're all Baruch Sports alums. So you should get all of these answers right, of course, very quickly. Let's go. Number one. There's, there's going to be eight of these. Here's number one. Which Bearcat sport has the most all-time Cuniac championships to their credit? The most all-time. Give, give it a couple seconds. Give it maybe 10 seconds to think about it. The Baruch sport that has the most all-time QBAC championship to their credit. They have more than 10. They actually have 14 championships. What's the guess? What, what, what do we think it is? Huh? Swimming, obviously. Hey! <laughs> No. It's not swimming. I wish it was for your sake, but it is not swimming. All right, time's up. The answer is men's tennis. Yes. 14 uh, CUNYAC championships. <clears throat> their most recent one was in 2019. I also saw that they were well on their way to a 15th championship in 2020 when uh, you know what happened. So, so yeah, yeah, 14 championships to date. All right, question number two. Who owns the most school records for women's swimming? By far and away, the most record, the, the, the most school records for women's swimming. Charles Lampasso. Julia Sung. There it is. There it is. Julia Sung. You indeed. could not blur it out. You just... <laughs> Very good. Yes, 17 school records, I believe. Seven relay records and nine freshman records to boot. 17 total. All right, question number three. Back in the mid 2000s aughts, so that would mean the first decade of this century, the mid 2000s aughts, which Baruch sports team went from worst to first, capturing a CUNYAC championship? So they were last place one year. Yeah. Soccer. <laughs> yes, very good, very good. Can't hold them back. In 2004, men's soccer captured a CUNYAC championship. We got a conflict of interest there. That's the soccer coach. Come on. 
<laughs> I don't think there's any more soccer questions. So, all right, question four. Back in, oh, no, no, sorry, I just read. The women's cross country team won their very first CUNYAC <laughs> title in what year? What year was that? It was sometime in the 2000s. Cross country. All right, any guesses? Any out loud guesses? Pick a number between 2001 and 2010. All right, time's up. The very first CUNYAC championship by the women's cross country team was in 2007. 2007, that was a great year. That was the year I moved to New York City. Long time ago for me. Question five. Baruch alum Peter Lewison represented the U.S. in both the 1984 and 1988 Summer Olympics in which sport? Fencing. Judging. Yep. There it is again. Fencing. That is the correct answer. He competed in the individual and team foil events in 1984 in Los Angeles, and then again in 1988 in Seoul. Peter Lewison. I don't, here's a question. I don't know when, when fencing, I believe that fencing is no longer a sport at Baruch. I wonder when fencing uh, stopped being a sport. Uh, early 90s. Okay. Question six. In the early 2000s, the athletics facility found their new home in what building? <laughs> Where are they now? It was the easiest one. Yeah, well, say it. You walk then. in and you go down the stairs. What building is that? What's the full name though? What's the full name of the building? Who paid a lot of money to put their name on the front of it? Is that Lawrence? That would be William and Anita Newman, the William and Anita Newman, Newman oh, Vertical Campus, which opened in 2002. Question seven. Which sport is the only that Baruch has represented in an NCAA Final Four? Volleyball. NCAA volleyball. Final Four. Men's volleyball. Good job. Wow, men's volleyball. No, no takers for women's volleyball? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is true. Men's volleyball in 2013 was in the Division Three Final Four against, is it Riviere? I don't even know how to pronounce it. Riviere University in New Hampshire and then Nazareth College in Rochester and then the eventual champion Springfield College in Massachusetts. Here's question eight. Here's the last question of this round. This one will be a multiple choice question. Baruch athletics legend Bert Beagle is best known for what? Is it A, throwing a nasty curveball, B, being an expert scuba diver, C, being a whiz statistician, or D, scoring over 1,000 points while in a Bearcat uniform? Statistician. Definitely C. Bert Beagle, good old Bert Beagle. I, yeah, statistician is the answer. Letter C is the answer, statistician. He was a whiz statistician. I, uh, I enjoyed researching him. He was also an accountant, so he did people's taxes. He was a sports information director, and he scored every single men's and women's Baruch basketball game between 1969 and 2006. Never missed an entire game, and he passed away in 2007. All right, moving on now to round three. Round three is going to be an audio round. I mentioned my quirks. I love logos. I also have a weird thing for TV theme songs. So I'm going to give that gift to you now for this next round. I'm going to give you some TV theme songs. All of these theme songs have something to do with sports though. It was either a television show, a comedy or drama about sports, or it's a 
theme for a sports program, you know, like a, a, a TV channel or a network that airs a certain sport, okay? So I'm gonna play you five of them. I'll play you all five in one fell swoop, and then we'll go through each one individually again, and uh, we'll find out which each one is. All right, so let me share my screen with sound. Here is theme song number one. All right, that was the first one. Actually, why don't we just go ahead and, and do each one individually because each theme I've, I've put down about 30 seconds each. So I've, you probably had enough time to think about it. So what was that theme? I got this answer from my fiance, but he said Fox Sports. CBS. I'm afraid CBS. it's not Fox. Fox. Close, not, <laughs> I, I heard somebody with the right answer though. CBS. It is CBS and what sport? Football. 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 NFL to be to be more precise, because I think they also have a college theme. Yes, yeah, so the NFL on CBS is the correct answer. They've been using that theme since the 2003 season in various uh, iterations. All right, moving on now to number two. All right, that is a theme song for a TV show that's currently on now. Especially if you're, well, if you, uh, it's an Apple Plus show, I'll give you an extra hint. It's very popular right now, only has one season in the can. Ted Lasso. Yes, very good. Ted Lasso is the answer with Jason Sudeikis. He's a, he didn't go to the, he, okay, so my alma mater is the University of Kansas, which unfortunately has fallen on some hard times the last couple of days. We fired our football coach and our AD this week. Not, not too great. But yeah, Ted Lasso, uh, Jason Sudeikis, I went to college with his sister. They both are from the Kansas City area, though, so that's kind of cool. All right, number, number three, number three. Coach. Yep, I heard one person with the right answer. Yep, that is correct. Ran for nine seasons on ABC. It's Coach, Coach with uh, Craig T. Nelson in the uh, title role. He was the coach. I think he was like a coach in college, and in the last few seasons, they like were in some sort of fake professional team in Orlando. All right, number four. Hello. NBC. Right. What was that? NBC, NBA. You got half right. You got Inside half right. stuff? Inside stuff? <laughs> no, it's not NBC. It's not NBC at all. Oh. But it is the NBA. You're halfway there. 
So ESPN. Not, ESPN. Yes, there it is. ESPN, the NBA on ESPN. Technically, also e, uh, the NBA on ABC. They don't have ABC Sports anymore. They just have ESPN on ABC. Yeah. All right. Last one, number five. <laughs> Friday Night Lights. I heard, I heard somebody yell it out. Yes, that is true. That is right. The answer is Friday Night Lights. It was on NBC for a few seasons. And then when the writer's stri strike happened in 2008, they uh, canceled the show. And then some cable channel picked it up for another, like, three seasons yeah friday night lights based after the book and then the movie yes great show indeed all right let's move on now to round four round four is going to be another photo round now this one admittedly has nothing to do with sports but it has everything to do with baruch and the area around it so all of these some of these are pretty easy some of them are not so easy they're all uh, locations or locales near the college, all right? So just like the first round, I'm going to go through all of them in one pass. Don't say the answers out loud in the first pass, and then we'll go through them all individually again, and uh, then you can say the answers out loud, okay? So no, no shouting out the answers for the first pass through all of these. So there's your vertical college there. So that's not, that's not number one. That's not number one. That would be too easy, all right? So now let's move on to number one. Still too easy in my opinion, but hey. Go ahead. Don't say it out loud yet. Don't say it out loud yet. Don't, don't, let everybody else think about it first though. This first pass, let everybody think about it. That's number one. Here's number two. Number Three, number four, two more, number five, I hope some of you get this one, and number six, I will be very, very impressed if somebody gets this one right. And the answer is not Calustians. That is not the answer. What does this, is, there's something special about this actual building. All right, let's go through each of them again. Now you can shout out the answers. What's number one? Union Square. Yes, very good, of course, Union Square, man. So I live in New Jersey now, so I don't come into Manhattan all that much anymore. So just seeing Union Square just makes me sad because it's been like a year since I've been there. Oy, good times in Union Square, though. Uh, it was uh, completed in 1882. By the way, here's some extra trivia for you. National Historic Landmark status in 1997 because it was the first Labor Day parade site. And there's George Washington there in the middle. All right, number two. Flatiron. Flatiron. Yes, very good. My wife used to work there in the Flatiron building, completed in 1902 and became a National Historic Landmark in 1989. Number three. Gramercy Park. Gramercy Park. That's right. You must have a key. You must have a key to the park. You got to have a key in order to hang out in Gramercy Park. Now, here's an extra bonus. I don't, does anybody know who this fella is here in the middle of the statue? He's an actor. He was an actor. By the way, the park was established in 1832 and maintains itself as a private neighborhood park. The person in the statue has a very famous brother because his, his brother, also an actor, was the guy who killed Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth. But this is Edwin Booth, who I guess didn't kill any presidents. Number four. Farmery. It's too easy. 
Yeah, the armory. The armory is correct. The 65th Regiment Armory, to be exact, which is on Lecht between 25th and 26th Street. It was completed in 1906 and became a historic landmark in 1965. Number five. It's Gerald Bar. It's. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's so much the closest bar to the vertical campus. So. Don't don't put your don't don't be ashamed for knowing that Fitzgerald's pub right there at 336 Third Avenue at 25th Street. So right there. My, in the kid, my kids were not allowed to answer that. Yeah. Opened in 1992. So if you were in Baruch 1992 and, and after, I'm sure you've uh, thrown back a couple drafts there. A lot and of missed classes. <laughs> missed classes. Nice. <laughs> All right. Last one. Number six. What makes this building special? The address is 123 Lexington Avenue. It actually became, believe it or not, if you look at it, it doesn't look like much. And these apartments up here, they sell, they rent for like $2,100 a month for a one bedroom, um, which in New York City standards isn't that much unless you're rent controlled. Became a National Historic Landmark in 1965, though, believe it or not, because it was the home at one point of President Chester A. Arthur. He owned the whole building there at 123 Lex. Chester Arthur, who was our 21st president between 1881 and 1885, there at the end of Reconstruction. One-term president, by the way. Good old Chester. Okay, now it's time, my friends, for the last question or the last round. Since it is March Madness, I saved the best for last. So we got some March Madness GIFs or GIFs, if you will, dot G-I-F, you know, the animated uh, images. So I'm going to show you five GIFs, just like uh, the, the other two um, uh, visual rounds. Don't say the answers out loud until we go through all of them one time, okay? So I'm going to show you each GIF, and I'm going to tell you exactly what I want for each answer. They all have something to do with an iconic, famous moment in March Madness history. Here is GIF number one. Oh. Don't say it out loud yet. I want to know who that guy is. Who's that guy? What is the name of that guy? And what team did he coach? What was the college that he coached? That's number one. And now number two. Well, I won't ask you what two teams are playing there because unless you're visually impaired, it's right there at the bottom. But you, if you do know, you could tell me who the, the name of the person Who's taking that shot right there? Who's taking that shot towards the end of regulation in this game? Moving on to number three is another last second shot. So you don't know which two teams are playing here. So why don't you tell me the names of the two teams in this shot? And if you're really adventurous or know your March Madness, you can also tell me the name of the fella taking that shot there. Number four. Now they're not actually in gameplay here, but you can tell me the name of this team and what made them so special, so special and historic in their game that they played in March Madness a couple of years ago. And here's the last one. Here's another last second shot. Who throws that pass all the way across the court and who takes that shot at the end? And you can tell me the name of the two teams. That full court pass, dribble, dribble, shoot, he scores. All right. So. If you're a March Madness fan like I am, hopefully you did well on this last round. <clears throat> Let's go back through it. Number one, who is this fella? Jimmy Valvano, North Carolina State. 
Yeah. Very good. Jimmy V, Jimmy V, Jim Balvano coaching NC State. He was looking for someone to hug in the 1983 championship game when NC State beat Phi Slamma Jamma 54 to 52. It was a desperation three shot by Lorenzo. No, let's see. Yeah. Lorenzo Charles, he put it in after Derek Wittenberg put up a desperation three, and then Charles kind of dunked it right there at the very end. Number two, who's taking that shot at the end of regulation there? This is a hard one. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's, it's not hard for me since I went to Kansas, but uh, <laughs> yeah. number 15 takes a shot there. He, uh, I think he's still in the NBA. I don't think he's retired yet. It's Mario Chalmers, Mario yes. Chalmers, who played at KU and then won a couple of NBA titles uh, as a role player with the Heat, along with uh, LeBron. So, yeah, Sharon Collins passes to Chalmers, sinks the three to tie the game, and then KU beats Memphis in overtime, 78, I'm sorry, 75 to 68. All right, number three, this one's a little more recent. What two teams are shown here? Villanova, North Carolina. Very good. Yes, yes. This was, I mean, I, I remember watching this live and I screamed like three times. And I I don't despise, but let's just say I strongly dislike both of these teams. Um, but yes, Chris Jenkins. Chris Jenkins puts up the game winner right after UNC tied the game with just a couple seconds left. And then Villanova puts in the last second three-pointer in 2016. Villanova, 77 UNC. 74. Number four. So this came out two or uh, a couple years ago. I shouldn't say two years, three years ago. Two year, two March Madnesses before, since we didn't have one last year. What was the name of this college? Was it Chicago Loyola with Sister uh, always at every game? No, no, but that's a that was a good guess. So let's see. I think they went to the final four in 2000, either 16 or 2017. But no, this was the uh, the Goliath killer yes, in, in 2018, UMBC, which is the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Baltimore County, yeah. beat the number one overall seed, Virginia. And, the, and it wasn't even close, 74 to 54. So they were the lowest ranked seed within that round of 64, beating the top seed, Virginia, in 2018. How sweet that was. All right, and the last one, very iconic moment. Duke, Christian Leitner takes a shot. That's right. Who threw that half-court, full-court pass? Uh, I think Grant, Grant Hill. Hill. That's right, yeah. Grant Hill. Yes, Grant Hill, who was co-rookie of the year in 1993, I believe, along with Jason Kidd. So, yes, Grant Hill to Christian Leitner in 1992. Duke beats Kentucky by one point in overtime 103 to 102 all right very good very good my friends you have just finished social distance quiz night this portion of the event so all answers were worth three points you can give yourself some grains of salt for that last question or for that last round if you knew one or more of the uh, answers you know i'm not going to give you three points don't give yourself three points if you guess NC State for the first one because it had NC State written on, on the back of their jersey. So, yeah, give me three. You give yourselves three points for each correct answer and then tally up your scores and let's find out who our winner is if you're not too bashful to gloat in the, uh, in the limelight of being in first place. So... Who has more than 30 points? Mm. All right, I see, I see one hand raised. Who has more than 40 points? All right, Liz, how many points did you have? Didn't hear that. No, I, I, it says you're off mute, but I still can't hear you. All right. You can put it in the 39. chat. 39. Yeah, 39. Okay, 39. If anybody has more than 39 or has 39, speak up or forever hold your peace. All right, so there it is. 
Liz and Miguel, you are our winners of SDQN. Congratulations. Congratulations, Liz yeah. and Miguel. We have a prize for the winner. We do have a prize. I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask Aaron if you'd like to uh, let them know what they've won. Absolutely. So our winners will receive a for the food lovers experience, a private 60 minute experience with Chef Matt being able to cook a recipe of your choice. And this experience is valued at $150. And we'll email the gift card to you. So congratulations. Yay. Thank you. Oh, awesome. we hear you now. Excellent. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. <laughs> Very cool. All right, well, congratulations again, and thanks, everybody, for playing, and I'll stick around, but that ends my portion of the night, so, uh, yeah, moving on thank to the you. next. Thank, thank you so thank much, you. Brennan. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Yeah. yeah, what a great, a great round of trivia. I've learned so much now um, about Baruch and about sports in general, so thank you, Brandon. Um, also, everyone could just give a little uh, round of applause for Brandon for hosting. Brandon is also expecting his first child any day now, any minute now, in fact. Right. So congratulations on that as well, Brandon. We're all super excited for you. And thank you, uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we're going to, before we move on to the next phase of the uh, event, I did want to just ask if everyone could just put in the chat what sports you played and, uh, and when you graduated. It would be great to get a sense of, uh, of, you know, around when everyone graduated and uh, what sport they played. Just so then later when we, when we do some, uh, some networking at the end, we'll have a sense of who's who. Excellent, I'm seeing a lot of swimming, softball, fantastic, soccer, nice, a nice mix, very nice. There we go. Ah, tennis as well, yeah, there we go. I remember tennis from the trivia round, that was very good. So, our next portion uh, of the event is we're going to be able to take a look at Chef Matt Migliore, who's going to show us how to make a wonderful recipe for steak tacos, which you can all keep in mind when it's time for game day and you're watching uh, the big game, uh, whether it's March Madness or otherwise. So I'm gonna kick it to Chef Matt now, who's gonna show us, um, show us how to make this recipe. And then for those at home who might have the ingredients and wanna follow along, feel free to do so. You can follow along with Chef Matt, or you can check out the video recording of this afterwards if you want to cook along with him at your own pace. Chef Matt. Everyone, how are we doing? It's so nice to see you guys. It's so nice to meet everybody and a couple familiar faces. Liz Miguel, congratulations. Very happy that you won. That's amazing. Um, so I actually hopped on about 15 minutes earlier and I tried my luck at the trivia. Um, I got about a zero. Um, I did pretty terribly. <laughs> Um, if there were a couple of Yankee questions, I probably would have gotten those. But anyways, it's really happy. To, I'm really happy to see you guys. And uh, if you're all ready, if you're going to be following along, uh, we can get started. Um, so just a couple things um, before we get going. Um, so these tacos, um, <clears throat> it's a very kind of similar. So the, the salsa verde recipe is a very, sim very similar recipe to um, a friend of mine, um, you might know this restaurant, um, Casa Enrique. So it's a very similar recipe to his Salsa Verde. And I love that restaurant. It's, it's one of my favorites. I go there maybe like three to four times a month, right? Um, so first thing we need to do, um, what the French like to call mise en place, right? So if we haven't already, let's go ahead and gather all of our ingredients um, for our steak or our tempeh, which, was, which would be the uh, vegan option. Um, all of our ingredients for the garnish and our salsa verde. Now, with that being said, um, so in order to, to, to sear off the tempeh or to cook the protein or the skirt steak and to do the tortillas, we just need one large saute pan here. Now I'm using a 12 inch um, cast iron pan. Um, feel free to go ahead and use like a 10 to 12 inch nonstick pan um, or a stainless steel pan, or if you have a cast iron, that works perfectly fine as well. Okay, and then after that, we need one baking tray um, for our salsa verde that's gonna be lined with aluminum foil. Um, so the idea is what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna half all of our vegetables, place them on this tray here, dress them very lightly with oil, and then char them in our oven. 
So we also need our oven preset to about like 480 degrees on broil or like a very, very high broil with the rack all the way towards the top. Because the idea is we want to get a really nice dark char, like almost black on all of our vegetables. And then we just need a food processor or a blender for the salsa verde. Beautiful. So guys, first thing that we're gonna do, um, we're gonna prep all the vegetables for our salsa verde. Now again, this is a very, very simple recipe and a really, really delicious sauce that you can basically put on anything you want. It's really good with any kind of vegetable, like a roasted vegetable, um, roasted chicken, beef, shrimp, pork, you name it. It's a really, really nice condiment to put on basically anything. Now, first thing, um, we have our Spanish onion. Okay, so I'm using an onion that's about the size of a baseball. Okay, if you have anything larger about the size of like a softball or like a grapefruit, we're just gonna use half for this recipe, okay? So the idea is we're gonna use half for our salsa verde and then half for our garnish, okay? So everybody, whoever's following along, go ahead and grab your cutting board and your favorite knife that you like to use. <clears throat> and just before um, we start cutting anything, I just wanna run through a quick little knife handling technique with everybody. Um, so using your dominant hand, um, what we're going to do is we're going to pinch the knife on the metal part itself, like on the blade itself like this, okay, with our index finger and our thumb, okay? And then we're just going to bring over our middle finger, our ring finger, and our pinky, okay? And we really want to grip up on the knife, right? Like basically right on the center of gravity of the knife, okay? So we have about maybe like two to three inches hanging off the back, right? Because this gives us a little more control over what we're cutting as opposed to holding it like, like a golf club, golf club or like a hammer or like a baseball bat, okay? So next thing that we're gonna do with our non-dominant hand, okay? So I know most of us, it, it might feel a little more comfortable to hold the onion like this or to hold whatever you're cutting with your fingertips out, but it's really good measure to kind of bring your fingertips in and your knuckles forward like this, right? So your knuckles are acting like a guide to with whatever you cut, okay? As opposed to leaving your fingertips out and exposed, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna knock off just the tip end here, okay? Just the top end here. Okay, we're gonna leave the root intact, all right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip it right on its flat side like this. We're gonna go right in half, okay? And then we're gonna save one half for our garnish so we can set this aside for now. And then the other half, we can go ahead and take off this root here and just peel back this initial layer. Okay, I like taking off the skin as well as the, uh, the first layer because the first layer is usually sometimes really green and it doesn't really char off nicely and it doesn't really heat nice. Okay, now with our onion, we just wanna cut this into quarters, okay? So we're doing one cut down like this Okay, we're going to rotate that 90 degrees and then one more cut. Okay. And then I like placing all my veg face up like this on my tray. Okay, if you guys can see that. The next thing. Uh, once we get the onions, and it's fine. If they, if they start breaking up, don't worry about it. That's all good. Again, we're just going to be blending this anyways. We want to make nice large chunks so there's, so there's a good amount of surface area for the heat. Beautiful. Okay, guys, next thing, we're going to take three tomatillos. So if they're large like this, right, if they can kind of fit in the, 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 um, the base of your palm, go ahead and use three. If they're a little bit smaller, like golf ball size, you can use four to five. Now for the tomatillos, you're gonna notice they're, they're kind of sticky. Okay, you don't, you don't actually have to rinse these off. I mean, if there's like a little exterior dirt on them, obviously I'd rinse them off, but all the stickiness is, is just sugar. Okay, and this is actually gonna help the tomatillos char, right? So when we take like infrared heat and sugar and it caramelizes, it becomes really, really sweet. So if we get like a little something like that on there, we can go ahead and just wipe that off with our fingers. No big deal. All right, guys. And so for the tomatillos, all we're going to do, very simple, 
just right in half. Okay, so right in half. And again, same thing. We're gonna go cut side up on our baking tray. Just like that. And if anyone, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to unmute. Okay, we don't have to sit in silence. I would love to get, you know, I wanna get you guys going. I wanna see what work you're doing, how it's going, how we're coming along too, okay? Beautiful, Liz. All right, guys, next up on the roster are poblano. Now, poblanos are a little more mild, um, like unlike it's like evil twin brother, the, the jalapeno. Um, the jalapenos now may not be that spicy just because of the season that we're in, but usually in the summertime, the chilies are a lot more, a lot more spicy. They have a little more heat to them. Um, but usually traditionally poblanos are a little more mild. Um, it gives it like a good amount of heat, um, without like really just rocking your world. Okay. So what we're going to do with the poblano, okay, we're going to go ahead and cut this in half with the stem on and everything like that. So we're going to go right in half lengthwise. Okay. And then we're gonna expose all these seeds like this. Okay, what we wanna do is try to flatten this out the best we can, and then just use our knife parallel to the cutting board and just take out this core. Okay, you're gonna notice there's a couple ribs in here or a couple like these little white pieces. We wanna take these out along with the rest of the seeds. Okay, and we're gonna do that with both halves. All right, and again, you can just take the tip of your knife like this, go ahead and just scrape out all those seeds. Beautiful. Okay, and all we wanna do with these, we're gonna cut these one more time in half, okay, like this. And we wanna make sure that, so each vegetable is relatively the same size according to its cook time. Right, so we're putting all these vegetables in the broiler together, right? But we want them to all be um, properly cooked, like to the right doneness and the right char. That's why some of them may look different sizes. Okay. So you're gonna notice in the recipe, so these are the vegetables that are gonna get charred, right? So once we char something, we impart a lot of really, really good caramelization, a lot of really good smoky flavor to the salsa verde, right? But the other vegetables like the cilantro, the jalapeno um, and the garlic, we're not gonna char those because we don't want those to burn, okay? And the garlic, we really want like a nice raw allium in there as well to give it a little more character along with a little more heat from the jalapeno, right? So first thing we're going to do, we're going to take just a little bit of vegetable oil here. I would say you can, you can kind of eyeball it, maybe like a one count pour here, um, about like one to one and a half tablespoons. Okay. Just a really light drizzle over the veg. Okay. And once we get these all situated again, so everything basically kind of face up, skin down, right? Little drizzle of oil. Okay, we're gonna go top shelf in our broiler for about 10 to 15 minutes. And one more thing, if you have a very sensitive smoke alarm, now's the time to take out the batteries. <laughs> cooking with heat tonight beautiful i want to give you guys a quick second to get that situated um, next thing that we're going to work on we're going to work on our garnishes for our tacos were we supposed to put the garlic in there too no not yet so the okay. so the garlic and the jalapeno and the cilantro we're going to save that for after once the vegetables come out, we're gonna blend all that together with like the oil and the vinegar. 
Yeah, so the garlic, like the garlic will burn pretty quick, but it's also nice to have a little bit of raw garlic in there to give it a little more allium, a little more onion, like onion flavor, a little more earthiness rather. Beautiful. So let's go ahead and bring back that half of our Spanish onion. Now we're going to do a little bit of some knife work here. Okay. Some knife handling techniques. Okay. And the knife cut I'm going to show you is called a small dice. Okay. So typically in, let's say like French cooking, right? There's um, a lot of different knife cuts that you can do, such as like medium dice, large dice, julienne, batonets, right? But they're all measured perfectly, right? So a, a small dice is typically um, an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch by an eighth of an inch, but we're not going to make it super, super perfect because these tacos are supposed to be eaten after you drink about four shots of tequila. So <laughs> beautiful. So what we want to do guys, we're going to take off the exterior of the onion here again, same thing, the skin with that initial first layer. Okay. And again, we're keeping the root on because when we make our cuts, right? So we're going to be making cuts going straight up and down here, and then we're going to rotate the onion. And then we're going to be making cuts going parallel to our cutting board. Right. And doing those cuts, we want to make sure that we have a core or a root here to keep everything intact. Okay. So what we're going to do first, let me bring my computer here a little bit closer. <clears throat> so we're going to face the root away from us. Okay. Because again, we want to make sure that our onion stays intact. Right. So we notice that an onion basically has like a contour to it. Right. So instead of going straight up and down like this. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to start with the tip here. Okay, and you can see I'm not going all the way towards the back of the onion. I'm leaving about a quarter of an inch off the back, right? So all I wanna do is go straight down like this, slice back. Okay, and again, we're, we're doing our best to do about an eighth of an inch, but if you can't get that thin, do about a quarter of an inch. Okay, and you see what I'm doing? I'm just using the tip of my knife here and just drawing my knife backwards just to make sure that all of this stays in place. Right. And once we get to the edge here, just do your best to kind of go in at an angle. Right. So that way, once we cut this and we have the root still on, right, everything just kind of stays all together. Right. It makes it so much easier in the long run to cut. All right. And then last but not least, um, or excuse me, for our second primal cut, we're going to have our knife closer, more parallel to the cutting board. So what I like to do instead of holding the knife like this, I'm going to place my index finger on top of the knife to give it more of like a fulcrum. Okay. More of like a pressure point. Exactly. All right. All we want to do, we want to start at the top here. Okay. And these can be a little bit larger as opposed to an eighth of an inch. You can go about a quarter of an inch. And I'm going straight through, okay? And again, same thing, all the way to the back, but not completely through. So it's about, I would say about like three to four cuts. All right, so again, what I'm doing is I'm starting like at the heel of the knife here. I'm just kind of jigging it like this just to get it in. And then I'm just sliding back like this with my knife. Just one stroke. And everyone, don't don't be worried if you don't get it if you don't get it the first time. I probably cut maybe I don't know maybe fifty thousand pounds of onions in my day. So <laughs> it takes it takes a while. Like when I did when I was at culinary school, I used to go out and buy like bags of potatoes, bags of onions, and I used to sit in my dorm room and just practice. So it takes it takes a while. All right, so again, we're looking at something like this. And again, it's, it's going to fall apart a little bit, but no worries, right? So we have like both ways here. Okay, and last but not least for our third and final cut. Okay, we're just going to do long strokes, right? So we're going to start at the tip here and then just go straight through like this, making one long stroke, a slicing motion, okay? And again, we're going to go about eighth of an inch. And if you can't, go ahead and try a quarter of an inch. So a quarter of an inch is basically about the size of like your index finger now, I would say. A little bit smaller. All 
Okay. And then all the way back until we get to this little core piece here. So what we should be seeing right, are just little guys like that. Right, so this is what this is what you would call a small dice. Okay, because the idea is, you know, for onions, like when you when you chop them up a lot, you start crying, they start getting juiced. So the idea is like there's there's really no way around crying when you're cutting onions. Um, a good way to kind of like stop all that is having a sharp knife and like good ventilation, um, and doing minimal amount of cuts as you possibly can. So if you're just like chop, 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 you're gonna get more of that like gas in the air and it's gonna make you start tearing up. Okay, and now for the back end here, because we don't wanna waste anything, right? So we're just gonna nip off this root here. Okay, go ahead and just lay this onion down on its flat side. And then we're just gonna go ahead and run through it with our knife. Okay, just gonna break this up just a little bit. Just like that, we're gonna add that directly to our pile. You know, another thing too, contacts, having contact lenses. That's another good one. It's like my, my natural like onion goggle. Okay, and then for the onions, we're gonna go ahead and we can set these aside. For now, and I want you guys to give give a quick peek to your um, your 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 vegetables in the oven right now. Your poblano, tomatillo, onions. Okay, and what we should be looking at is we want the vegetables to start to start to have a really really nice char, and you can see they're not quite there yet. Okay, they're still pretty blonde, but they're, they're starting to char up a little bit, right? We're gonna give these about like 10 more minutes, I'd say. Okay, beautiful. Next thing, um, let's move on to our radish. Okay, now the radish is really good for the garnish because it adds like an extra level of crunchiness and nice juiciness. Beautiful. So what I like to do with these guys, after I give them a quick rinse and dab them off dry with a paper towel, what I'm gonna do is just take off just a tiny little end here, right? The reason why I'm doing this is because I wanna create a platform, right? Because we don't wanna use a sharp knife with something that rolls around. Right, that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. So we're gonna use about two to three radishes. And again, we're taking off just a little end here. So we have a flat surface. Beautiful. And the next kind of knife cut that we're gonna do, all right? So we're basically gonna try to do like a rocking motion, right? Almost like a circular motion with our knife, right? So the idea is what we wanna do is we wanna to start towards the back, bring our knife up and back, and then down and forward is on the slice. Okay, and this is when we wanna go as thin as possible. So again, I'm going up and back, down and forward. Remember, protect those fingers. Remember what we're doing is we're bringing our fingertips in and our knuckle, knuckles forward to create a guide for our blade. Okay, so we should have nice little baby circles like that. All right, and same thing with the other one. Beautiful. All right, just these little beautiful discs of radish. All 
right? And then in the meantime, we can just set these off to the side too, all right? And now what I want everybody to do is if you are following along, go ahead and pull out your skirt steak um, or your flank steak or your tempeh or your vegetarian substitute. So what we're gonna do with the, the protein, okay, I want everybody to grab just a couple pieces of paper towel and maybe like a small container, all right? And we're gonna take this bad boy out of the marinade and directly onto some dry paper towels, okay? Because the way that we're gonna cook this steak in a really hot pan with some oil, water and moisture and liquid is the enemy of hot oil, right? Because that's how you start getting grease fires. That's how you get a lot of splatters. So we want to make sure that everything's nice and dry because the meat itself has had plenty of time to marinate. So all those delicious flavors like the, the fish sauce or the soy, the brown sugar, the garlic, everything has had enough time to kind of permeate. Beautiful. What we're going to do again, so go ahead, just wrap it in paper towels, you know, tuck it in. Beautiful. And then we're gonna move over to our skillet here. Now, what we wanna do um, with our pan, we're gonna go ahead and place this on a high heat. And we wanna add about two, one to two tablespoons of vegetable oil, nothing crazy. Okay, so a really, really light amount just to kind of gloss the bottom of the pan there. Beautiful. And what we want to do is we're going to let this heat up on high heat. Okay, and once we start seeing just a little bit of smoke here, that's when we're going to add in our protein. Okay. And same thing with the tempeh if you're using tempeh. All right. Now with our, with our protein, um, we're just going to take a small pinch of kosher salt, maybe about like half a teaspoon. Okay, just a light amount, remember, because our soy or our fish sauce that we're using to marinate is already pretty salty, right? But we just want to create just a small exterior on the protein itself just to dry it out. So give us like another maybe 60 seconds to heat up. Should be almost there. And if you're using a cast iron, usually it takes a little bit longer um, to heat up. Uh, if you're using like a stainless steel or a non stick, it should, up, should heat up relatively quickly. All right, once we start getting a little bit of smoke here, so if we're using skirt steak, so we have two sides here, right? We have the fatty side and then we have the lean side. Okay, we always wanna go fat side down first. All right, so I'm gonna go into my pan like this and then I'm gonna gently lay it away from me. Okay, so I'm not splashing any oil towards me. Now, once we put the steak in the pan or we put the tempeh in the pan, we don't wanna agitate the pan, okay? Because what's happening now it's called like a Maillard effect or a Maillard reaction. And what that is, it's taking heat and it's caramelizing the sugars in the protein, okay? And if we agitate that protein, a lot of liquid or juice is gonna come out and it's gonna start steaming the pan. It's gonna start cooling off the pan. And we're not gonna get a really nice crust or sear on our protein. So once, we, once it's been there for about 30 seconds, yeah, we just move it around just a little bit, not shake it, but just physically move it. And you want to see this smoke. This smoke is really, really good for the protein. All right, so we want to give it maybe about, I would say, a minute and a half to two minutes on one side, 
And then once we flip it, we're gonna do about another minute and a half to two minutes on the other side. All right, so just to give everybody a quick frame of reference here. So this is good stuff. That's what we wanna see with our, with our protein. Okay, so once you get this on one side, go ahead and flip it on the opposite side. Hey guys, while we're working that, I want to go ahead and show my broiled um, vegetables here, my poblanos, my onions, um, tomatillos. So the tomatillos aren't going to get a crazy amount of color because they're basically like 98% water, right? But as long as we get just like an initial, you know, char on them like this, that's perfect. The poblanos are going to char much quicker, as we can see. Same thing with the onions. So I'm going to give these maybe just like two more minutes, okay? They're just about there. Just a little tiny bit more color on these. Beautiful. You guys, just one more time again. So this is the opposite side now. So we're gonna let this cook on high heat. Okay, I'm gonna flip it one more time. I'm gonna let it go for another couple minutes. Matt, when you were asked, when you were talking about salt, the kosher salt earlier, what were you, have you ever used black salt? Um, black salt, like in terms of what, like lava salt? I, I don't know, I, I don't really know. I was, it was so funny because when I first started like following you, I thought I followed you on Instagram and it was his other like chef, Matt. And he was like, I was like, wow, I thought it was you. And it was like, he came, he was like, black salt, black salt, you need black salt. And I'm like, wow, black salt. He really likes black salt. And then I realized it wasn't you, oh, honestly, <laughs> but I was like, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just like, what is black salt? You know? No, that's honestly, it, it might be, it might be infused with like charcoal or it might be a smoked salt. Oh God. Like I have like, sense. I have like a smoked, I have like a smoked Malden sea salt. And it has like a, like a, like a tint, like a, like a, almost like a brown hue to it, but it's not black. I, I would assume okay. it's infused with something. Right. Right. Makes sense. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But typically like kosher salt is like my all purpose seasoning. If I, you can do like Himalayan pink salt, like, like a, um, like a salt or like a, you know, like a, like a French type of salt or any kind of sea salt rather. I just prefer not to use like an iodized salt, something that's treated with iodine. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. So we want to go for about, so just about there and a little frame of reference. Okay. So just to judge how a steak is cooked. A lot of people say this is a myth, but it's kind of true. Um, especially with like skirt steak, New York strip steak, or like ribeye. So Liz and Miguel just go a little bit. If you can get it a little bit hotter, that'd be great. If it's all the way up at high, just leave it on that one side. So a good frame of reference. So for like a rare, like put your, your index finger and your thumbs together without applying pressure, like no pressure whatsoever. Right. And then press onto your, your thumb muscle right here. So this is like rare. Okay. And then do your middle finger and your thumb. This is like a medium rare. Again, you're applying no pressure. You're not squeezing. Right. And then your pinky is like a medium to med well, or excuse me, your, your ring finger is a medium to med well. And then your pinky is about like a well done. If you ever see somebody kind of, you know, kind of bounce at it like that. So I'm about at like a medium, like a rare to medium rare. So I'm going to pull it off right now. And I'm pulling it off right now is because protein, it carry, it carry, it has carryover cooking, right? So it stays internally hot, right? And once you take it off the heat source, it's actually still goes up about a few, few degrees, like three to five degrees, depending on the size of the protein and the weight of the protein. So if you're using like a, like an eight ounce piece of skirt steak or a really thin piece, it'll probably only carry over a couple more degrees. 
right? So in the meantime, if you pulled off your steak, okay, again, so I did maybe like, I would say three minutes on each side total. All right, and once we pull our steak off, we're gonna turn our pan off and then give this a quick rinse underwater. Okay, and then just like a dirty towel, or a, excuse me, a dry towel, or um, a dry piece of paper towel, and just wipe our pan out, okay? And we're gonna be using this for our tortillas. Beautiful. Okay, guys, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pull out my, my poblanos, my onions, my tomatillos, okay? We have a really, really nice char here. Everything's starting to turn a little bit black. That's exactly what we want. Okay, so what we're gonna do next, so guys, give it, give a check. If you are cooking along, give a check to your roasted veg. And I would love to take a look and see what you guys have. Okay, Liz, we got a little bit longer. You have it, you have it like all the way top rack, high broil. Okay, yeah, a little bit longer. Keep on rocking it. Beautiful. So what we're gonna do once the vegetables um, are finished, okay, what we can do in the meantime, while they're still cooking, <clears throat> um, we're gonna get our, um, our jalapenos and our garlic into the blender along with our vinegar and our oils. So I love spicy. I think salsa verde needs a good amount of heat to really call it salsa verde. So I'm gonna be using a whole jalapeno because I'm very partial to heat. If you're not so much, um, I would just use half of a jalapeno. You guys, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my jalapeno. Okay, same thing like the poblano here. I'm gonna go right in half. Okay, and I'm gonna use the whole thing. Obviously I'm gonna cut off the stems here, but I'm gonna use the whole thing, including the seeds, right? The seeds pack a good amount of spice in the jalapeno. So I'm gonna use all the seeds, everything. If you don't like spice, I suggest doing the same thing that we did with the poblano, kind of flatten it out a little bit and then just use your knife to cut these seeds out, okay? And then we're gonna go right into the blender. Okay, and then two cloves of garlic. And for the garlic, all we're gonna do is just cut off the little root end here. Or if you want, if it's much easier for you, what we can do is place our knife flat down like this, give it a quick little whack, and then peel the skin back. Okay, so we have a whole clove of garlic here. We're gonna go right into the blender. Okay, so now in our blender right now, we have our jalapeno and our garlic. The next thing we're gonna go ahead and add in um, three tablespoons of vinegar, just regular white vinegar. Okay, and Liz Miguel, I would, if you haven't already, I would pull the steaks off. I think they're good to go. Okay, next thing, we're gonna take a lime, cut this right in half, and we're gonna do the juice of one lime.
Okay. And then you're going to take your plum tomato, just cut your plum tomato in half and then throw that right into the blender as well. Okay. And then next thing we want to go in with one whole bunch of cilantro. Now with the cilantro, we're going to use the whole, basically the whole bunch. We're going to take a couple sprigs out that we're going to save for garnish, but we can take the whole head of cilantro and just kind of rip it off the stem like that and just cram it right into our blender. Again, we're going to save maybe just two to three sprigs, you know, for garnish that we're going to use for the leaves for our tacos. Okay. And then we're going to do half a cup of our oil. Love cilantro. Love it. <laughs> my, it's funny because my, my background is like Southeast Asian, Japanese, and Peruvian. So it's like I'm constantly surrounded by like cases of cilantro whenever I worked in a restaurant. Just like quantities of cilantro, ginger, garlic, scallion, like everything. Beautiful. All right, guys. And now we're going to go ahead and grab our roasted veg here. Right. And like everything, right. Including all the juice that's on the tray here. We're going to go ahead and dump this right in. That's my walk-off song. It's my theme song. Beautiful. So the poblanos, the tomatillos, we have our plum tomatoes in there, some garlic. So you're kind of you're kind of seeing where this is all starting to go. Right? Super pungent, super in your face, spicy, aromatic, tart, like sour from the vinegar. It's supposed to hit like all different flavor profiles, right? Okay, so last but not least, salt, right? So all of this means nothing without this, right? So whenever you hear like in a recipe or if you ever watch a cooking show and the chef says, okay, we're going to season it. So primarily seasoning just means adding salt to it because salt enhances flavor. So like if you ever take like, let's say like a piece of watermelon, right? You eat a piece of watermelon regular. It's like really good, super juicy. And then you add a little bit of salt to it. You're like, wow, this actually tastes like watermelon. You know, it's like, it's, it's night and day with anything. All right, so let's go ahead and add in. Let's start with about one teaspoon of salt, okay? Because the thing with salt is that you can always add, but you can never take away from it, right? If you if you over if you over season it, if you over salt it, you got to make it again. <laughs> no going back. <laughs> All right, let's bring you guys back over. Okay, so what we want for our salsa verde, we don't necessarily want like a really fine puree from it. Okay, we want it still kind of chunky, right? So what's going to happen because we have so many like dry, like there's a lot of dry ingredient, especially from the cilantro leaves, the blade might not catch like automatically, right? So just give it a couple pulses. And once it all starts to catch, let it blend for like 10 seconds. That's it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to actually place myself on mute because I'm sure nobody wants to hear this. <laughs> And that's literally it, guys. Okay. So the salsa verde, we just let it run for about, I would say like 10 seconds. Chef, we got a question uh, from Ryan in the chat that said, do you have any recommendations if you have a smaller food processor? So Ryan, are you using like a, like a Nutribullet? Uh-oh. You're muted. I don't, I don't, I don't hear him. Oh, he's got it. It might be a KitchenAid, but I think it or Cuisine Art, but I think it's only like two cups. Um, 
yeah, it doesn't hold that much. Not as you big as yours. In, in smaller batches. Just smaller batches, got it. Yeah, so basically you would just take half the amount of cilantro, like one clove of garlic, half the amount of jalapeno. Half Everything's the amount still of together though, right? Exactly. And just kind of what you can do is put them in separate containers and then dump one in the blender, blend that, and then take another one and dump that in the blender. So it's like, it's both equal. And then you just add them all together, like in a mixing bowl to got adjust it. the seasoning. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That way you can add them all together, add some more lime, some salt, whatever you need. Yeah. Okay, guys. So what we're going to do next, before we start cooking off our tortillas, let's give this a taste, right? All right. So. Hey, Max, quick question. Mine is not green. It kind of looks brownish. So okay? I didn't add, I didn't add any tomato to mine. Tomato to mine. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't add any tomato. So yours is going to be a little bit darker, like more of okay. like a red. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Taste it. It's definitely going to need a little more salt. So I'm going to add like a whole nother teaspoon of salt to mine. Okay. But I like the level of acid that's there, right? The oil gives it a little more fat, gives it a little body, right? But I just want to add a little salt to mine. Okay. Stir this together. You don't have to reblend it. Just go ahead and stir it. Beautiful. Right. It's well seasoned. It's sour. It's like fruity, it's roasted. Okay. And then last but not least, um, our tortillas. Now I'm using a white corn tortilla. Uh, I love these. These are like your typical like street tacos, right? The white tortillas. So I'm gonna place that same pan that I used for the steak on high heat. Okay, I'm gonna let this come up to temp, let it get nice and hot. And we're doing no oil, okay? We wanna cook these dry, okay? All we're doing is we're just basically charring the outsides just relatively quickly, all right? And next thing that we're gonna need, just a small plate with a damp paper towel. So the tortillas that we finish can stay nice and moist under this paper towel once we're done charring them. Okay, so I'm gonna go three at a time here. And it's okay if they overlap just a little bit. Now the waiting game. So what we're gonna start seeing is we're gonna start seeing just a little bit of bubbles here, okay, throughout the tortilla. Okay, and again, we just want just a little bit of color on the outsides because they're, 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 they're already kind of steamed, right? They're not really like cooked when they're cooked in, when they're made in like the factory. Um, they're kind of steamed, right? So we just wanna get a little more color and cook them a little bit more through. All right, we're starting to get some nice steam off these. Okay, and feel free, use a pair of tongs or you can go ahead and just use your hands. <laughs> if you have like strong asbestos hands like this. Okay, beautiful. And again, this was, this was about, I would say a minute. All right, so super quick. Okay, because we don't wanna cook these too much or else they're gonna get crunchy, okay. Right, so right onto the plate and then our towel just right over so they stay nice and moist. Okay. And then the last piece of garnish that we're gonna do before we slice our steak and make our tacos, our lime wedges. Now you might think like, oh, I'll just cut a lime in like quarters and like that'll be it. I mean, you could do that. But what I like to do is I like to go right down the middle of the lime here, kind of like right down the axis. Okay, and then I'll cut this in quarters one more time. All right, and then I'll place it on its flat side like this and just cut out the middle part. Okay, so it looks really nice. And then whenever you squeeze the line, it goes straight down into your container as opposed to going everywhere, or getting in your eye. All right, so we're gonna do that with all four wedges here.
So guys, again, so we have our salsa verde that's super delicious. We season with salt, hit it with a little lime. Okay, we have our Bruno. Hey, Matt. Yeah, what's up? Sorry, just one more time. What's the purpose of taking out that little white thing? So the, the little white thing, so if you don't take it out when you squeeze the lime, it has a tendency to kind of spray everywhere. But taking out that kind of makes like a stream for it. So if you take that out and you squeeze it down into whatever you're squeezing it on, it goes, it just drops straight on. Uh, wow. That's like, so nice. It's it such a simple like, thing, but yeah, it, exactly. It's like an OCD chef thing. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. It's like whenever I do like lemons too, like I'll cut the wedges, do the same thing and pick out all the seeds, you know, <laughs> it's just like one of those little things. It's one of those little things that, you know, that really kind of like do it, that it's like one of those subliminal things. You're like, wow, that's like a lot of thought that's really put into it. You know, I think those things are really special. Like when I yeah. go out to a restaurant, you know? Yeah. 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 No, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. Of course. All right, guys. So I'm going to grab the steak here. Right. And we can see that our steak, it has these little kind of grains, right? Going this way, right? So what we want to do is rotate the steak. So we're cutting perpendicular to these grains. Okay. We will always want to go across the grain, right? What I'm going to do is just go ahead and slice. Okay. The reason why we're going against the grain is because when you eat it, it makes it a little more eatable, right? It makes it a little more palatable. It's not chewy. It's nice. And, it's a nice soft piece of meat. Okay. And go as thin as you can. I mean, it doesn't have to be crazy thin. Beautiful. And we should have like a really nice medium rare piece of meat. Again, we basically cook this for like six minutes total and let this rest for like a good eight minutes, right? And we can see like the beautiful protein, nice and medium rare. This is exactly what we want. All right, guys. So we're going to bring a plate over now. Okay. And we're going to start orchestrating our taco train here. So what I'm going to do with the tortillas, right, I'm just going to stack them like this. Okay. So we create little pockets. Oh, Miguel, beautiful. Nice cook. Beautiful. <laughs> Love it. That's like a, that's like a perfect medium right there, dude. Sick. That's amazing. Beautiful. You guys, what we can do, so we're going to start with a piece of steak here. All right, piece of steak down in each one. Okay. Some of this salsa verde, and I'm going to do, I'm going to be very generous with my salsa verde because the sauce really makes this taco. Right down. All right, and then some chopped up onion. Okay, this gives it a little more stringency, a little more heat and some texture. Okay. Few circles of our radish. Okay, you can do as many as you want. Okay, I just really, really love the texture. Just a couple pieces of cilantro. And then to finish, so I normally do the avocado last thing because I always want my avocado to be perfectly ripe, like nice and green, because once it hits the air, it starts to oxidize. Okay, guys, so for our avocado, I'm just gonna go ahead and split. Okay, right down the middle, go ahead and turn it. Open it up like this. Okay, and then using the back of our knife with a nice ripe avocado. Okay, gonna go ahead and make slices. Okay. And then just with a spoon, we're gonna go right down with a couple pieces of avocado on each individual taco. 
Okay. Yeah, really beautiful. Super, super simple, right? It's a very, very simple kind of dish. But as you can see in the pep preparation, the preparation is everything, right? Like how much care and thought we put into the sauce, the beautiful executed knife work that we did together and the care that we took for doing even the limes down to the cilantro and the last minute avocado. So guys, feel free. I would love for all of you to take pictures of your beautiful creations. I would love for you all to post them on Instagram, tag me. I would love to repost you guys and show everyone what an amazing job you guys did. Wow. Oh, it's and mine. of course. Wow. <laughs> I get to eat it. Hey Matt, this That's is the good. first this is the first time I see a taco that has like a whole piece of steak inside. I don't know. I it's usually Yeah, so normally like like for example like uh like if you do like pork like carnitas or something like that or yeah. or like uh, the carne asada like we'll chop it really thin, but I I think the fact that we did like a really nice medium rare piece of steak and because we cut it like really thin against the grain and because the marinade helped break down some of that protein it's actually quite soft. Oh, that's, yeah. Well, I didn't think about the effect that the marinade had on it. Yeah, it helps just break it down. It helps like, um, excuse me, um, season it just a little bit yeah. too. Like the sugar and the fish sauce, it really, it really does a lot to that protein to help break it down a little bit, but without like really kind of messing up the, I guess the integrity of the protein itself. Super interesting, thank you. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, dude, I love, an amazing shredded carne asada at like 2 30 in the morning i could eat like 12 of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome this is gonna be, this is gonna be fantastic thank you thank you, Except, thank you very much i enjoyed it i've got to run but uh, it's been a pleasure it's been great uh, i'm gonna kofi. follow you thank you yeah. kofi yeah you bet thanks Take guys care. thank you for joining us beautiful <laughs> guys thank, thank, you, so thank you thank you chef matt that was wonderful man <laughs> I think uh, if you weren't hungry already, you're hungry now. So, man, I have learned a lot throughout this event. I mean, between the, the cooking uh, knife, uh, knife tips, that was pretty appreciated there. And onion, cutting onion tips, amazing. As a quick, you know, I mentioned in the chat as well, cilantro is funny. Some people have a genetic predisposition yeah. to just disliking cilantro. So if you hate cilantro, there's just, there might not be anything you can do about it. And don't worry about it. But yeah. That's an odd thing, right? Yeah, and if you ever have like a, like for example, this recipe, you can also replace the cilantro with parsley as well. That's because I know really like good. some of those, the cilantro, like it tastes like soap, right? Nobody wants to eat that <laughs> if it tastes right. like soap. But yeah, right. a, good, a good substitution would be parsley. Excellent, thank you so much, uh, Matt. And we're gonna send this recording around so you'll be able to take a look at this. Um, yeah, that's right, Dima, yeah. <laughs> take, take, uh, take notes, excellent. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chef Matt. And, uh, you know, we have just a couple of other things to wrap up before, before we conclude for the evening. Um, first off, we do have some, some giveaways. We have a couple of other things to give away. So what we're going to do is Aaron's going to give me a number between 1 and 14. And I'm going to choose someone uh, based on the boxes on my screen. And we're going to give a gift to that person. So Aaron, go for it. Between 1 and 14. Absolutely. So my playing days, my number was four. So let's go with box number four. Doo -doo. We've got, we've got Cindy. Woohoo, Cindy. Cindy, are you there? Uh, you yeah. Have... Aaron, tell her what she's won. Cindy, you are our second winner for an experience with Chef Matt. So we will email that gift card out to you for the food lover experience for the 60 minute private experience oh, valued at $150. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Cindy. And another number, Aaron. Well, I have to go with my husband's playing number of number 13. There you go. We're looking at Sam, Sam Fassler. Perfect. Sam, you are the proud winner of some Baruch swag. So I will make sure that gets gathered up on Tuesday and I will mail it out to you. So congratulations. Dope, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Sam, thank you. Yay, Sam. Excellent. That was a fantastic event. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. I wanted to offer the opportunity of anyone on the 
in the event would want to uh, unmute themselves and just share a, uh, a Baruch memory from their playing days. Someone started that in the chat that I thought was, was really cool. If anybody wants to share a particular memory that stands out to them from their Baruch days, any alumni want to? Yeah, um, so the first memory that comes to mind is meeting Miguel and we were both on the swim team and we got married. So that's our- There you go. Memory. Excellent. That's a that's a good story. Anyone else want to share? Beating Hunter at CUNY Championship by two points. There you go. Always good to beat Hunter. One other th uh, thing before we wrap up, um, and we're going to send this out by email as well to our athletics alumni. We've created a bracket NCAA March Madness bracket challenge for Baruch alumni. I'm going to put the link to join that in the chat, but we'll also send this out by email. So feel free to join up, pick your teams, and we're going to have a Baruch alumni, uh, entirely alum Baruch alumni bracket challenge, um, and we'll see how you do. So go ahead and sign up, pick your teams. Thank you so much to everyone for being here. Um, and I, I know, as we said at the beginning, it's unfortunate we can't gather in person this year for our annual tradition, yeah. but we will hopefully do that next year. And uh, once it's safe to do that, and you know, fingers crossed that things continue to progress positively. Um, it was great seeing so many alumni here this evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, and we will be in touch soon. Thank you, Yi. Thank you, Aaron, Kerry, uh, John. John Nevis supplied some of those great trivia questions as well. So thank you everyone for being here and we'll be in touch. Have a great night, Take care, everybody. Great night. Good to see you guys. Go Bearcats forever. Thank you. Go Bearcats. Thank you.